Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at St. Andrews. Uh, can I welcome any who are joining us online today, elsewhere here in the town or across the globe? You're very welcome. We hope you feel part of our worshiping congregation this morning. This is our Sunday morning bulletin. I, I think you've all got one, and if you open up the middle pages, there you'll have a flavor of some of what's going on in the life of the congregation in the coming days and weeks. So there on page five, notice for example, at evening worship tonight as always starts at 6.30 with food from six o'clock. But let me give you advance notice, next Sunday evening, we are welcoming as our guest preacher, uh, the Reverend Pete Mead. Pete Mead is the new rector at, the, at St. Mary's Church, the Scottish Episcopal Church on Ponderlaw. Uh, Pete's a super guy, and he's a great asset to the, the Christian community here in our broth, and he'll be coming next Sunday night as our guest speaker, so put that in your diary. What else have we got here? A couple of things for Havala. First of all, that on this Thursday evening, following our normal prayer time, which is from 7 to 8, uh, from 8 to 9, we are gathering specifically to pray for our Havla work, and beyond that, specifically to pray for the funding situation which we are facing at the moment. So that's Thursday night at 8 o'clock. Thank you for that. Also, you'll notice a little notice down there about plastic takeaway containers. Uh, read that in conjunction with the above notice. Messy Church is next Sunday. That's ideal for families with preschool and primary school children. Next Sunday is Messy Church. To the right-hand side, two items regarding the guild. Tomorrow night is the annual meeting. Half past seven tomorrow night, the annual meeting. Our vocations volunteers will be part of that, uh, as will I. And then next Saturday, the guild coffee morning. So please support it if you are at all able. Thursday evening of this week, we pray for persecuted Christians around the world. The details are there, 10.15 in the morning this Thursday. And then into the back, inside page, a couple of further notices there. Stuart's induction, Stuart Irvin, our former associate, his induction is a week on Thursday, the 28th. There are a couple of seats left on the bus if you still are not signed up and want to come to Edinburgh for that special occasion then please do that, sign up now. Now, a couple of other things just over and above. Would home group leaders please see me very briefly after service? That is before we have our short communion, immediately after main service. Home group leaders, just come down here, please, and meet me just very briefly. A couple of other notices. Those who are on our prayer network would have received our prayer request last night uh, for Essie Faulkner, who is in Nine Wells and was two weeks, more than two weeks overdue the birth of their second child. Well, we put that prayer request out on our network, and within two hours, I got a message, the child is born. So uh, we rejoice with Essie and Billy and little Connor, their son. Uh, they have a girl. They have a girl to join the family. So we rejoice with them. Now, Tim, would you stand for a minute? Uh, Tim Minard. Uh, this time, next Sunday morning, Tim will be uh, competing in the London Marathon. I guess he'll be, he'll be halfway around by now. I'm asking him to stand. <laughs> I'm asking him to stand now because next Sunday he won't be standing after the marathon. But it's a great effort. He's doing it all for Oxfam, and we want to wish you well, Tim. Uh, I hope it's a fantastic occasion for you and the whole family. So let's wish Tim well. London Marathon next week. And finally, folks, uh, Chris, one of our aforementioned volunteers, uh, has a very brief note as well. Um, friends, thank you for uh, hearing this. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, you might remember that someone, I think Martin, stood up here and said that we had a survey for you all to fill out. Um, so it's been a couple of weeks since we initially handed those out. Um, so the first thing is that if you have those and if you've completed them, it would be wonderful and we would appreciate it so much if you would start kind of bringing them back now. 
Um, there's an envelope in the office that has my name on it, and if at any point during the week, if you just come in and drop it off to Linda, she will put it in that envelope. Or, second option, um, if you forgot what that is or you weren't here that Sunday, um, the survey looks a little something like this. And I have a few more. So if you in any way, shape, or form volunteer either inside the church and the functions of the church or out with the church in the community, it would be great if you would just give us a couple moments of your time so that we can get some information on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. So a survey uh, about our volunteering. If you have it, if you have not have it, then speak to Chris and get one of those forms or return the form that you previously took away. Friends, these are the notices. Uh, thank you for your attention. Let's now do what we have principally come to do, which is to worship God, to sing to his praise and glory. Now, our first song, the words may not be familiar, but the tune certainly will. The tune is the one that we use to that lovely old hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. So we're going to sing, and please, as we go through, take note that some of the verses are specifically for women to sing, some are for the men, and some are one thing and another. So just note on each page of the slides who will be singing that verse. Shall we stand? We were not there.
Well, we were not there when all these things happened to Jesus, but they have been written down for us by those who were there. And so we can trust and we can believe all that we read that happened to Jesus in these days. The third verse of the song we sang just there, it talked about what Jesus said. One of the things Jesus said while on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. And as we go on in today's service, we'll be thinking about that. Forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Well, to get us thinking about forgiveness, I want you to to think in little groups, maybe two or three of you here and there, about some of the following things. Now, children you can share with mums and dads or grandparents or whoever is around you, and some of these things might relate more to children, while adults can just think of adult versions of the same thing. So what I'm going to ask you are a number of things, and then I'll say, would you forgive someone if they did that to you? Would you forgive someone if they did that to you? So first one's maybe for, kind of relate to teenagers maybe and others, but you all can think of something that would be for yourself. Here it is. Somebody borrows your Xbox or PlayStation and they return it to you broken. Would you forgive the person who borrowed your Xbox and broke it. (laughs) Now, adults, if not an Xbox, put in something else instead of great value to you. Okay, here's the second one. Here's the second little situation. You are part of a group of friends. Maybe there's about six or seven of you. You do everything together. And then you read on Facebook or you hear all the friends went to the cinema to see a film and they didn't invite you. Would you forgive them for doing that to you? Here's the next one. Here's number three. You are at school or college or university, and you have spent a long time writing an essay. It was 2,000 words long. You spent hours and weeks doing it. Then you find out that someone found it and copied it and they handed it in as if it was their essay. (laughs) Would you forgive them for doing that, copying your essay? Number four, number four, you go into your garden shed and your bike's gone. You phone the police and a week later the police say, we caught the person who stole your bike and we can get your bike back. Do you forgive that person for stealing your bike?
And the last one, the last one, someone comes and they have a big family-sized bag of your favorite sweets. And they go around and they're offering them to, it seems like everybody, but they come and don't offer one to you. They walk right past you. My goodness, would you forgive them for not sharing with you? <laughs> no, no. Well, I'm not going to go through all of the questions and ask you to put your hands up and give your answers, but what I am going to do is tell you about somebody. Nearly 30 years ago, it was November, and it was 1987, November, and there was a special parade and all kinds of people had gathered at a certain point in a town. And the town was called Enniskillen. And they gathered there every November. In the crowd was a nurse. Her name was Marie Wilson. But there were other people in that crowd and before the big day and before the parade, these evil people had planted a bomb. And while all the other members in the town were gathered there at the parade, that bomb went off and it killed many, many people, including Marie Wilson. My goodness, imagine, imagine, imagine that had happened to somebody you loved. Well, it did happen to someone who loved Marie, her dad. His name was Gordon, Gordon Wilson. And Gordon right away said he would forgive the people who caused that bomb to go off and killed his daughter and all those other people. He said he would forgive them, and he did. And he said that he would be praying for them. I only asked you about sweets and Xboxes and trips to the cinema. You know, in the big scheme of things, not much. This man, Gordon, was an inspiration of really what it is for Christians to forgive. We're going to think more about this as our service goes on. For now, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father God, there will still be many people who remembered what happened in Enniskillen all those years ago. Still people alive who lost loved ones when the bomb went off. Lord, we thank you that Gordon was able to forgive and that his Christian forgiveness made such an impact the whole world over. Most of all, we are thankful that now in Northern Ireland, the shooting and the bombing has stopped. There is still a long way to go. Much more forgiveness needs to be done. But we have come a long way since Gordon said, I forgive them. Help us to be just as Christian as Gordon was and is. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, do you know, 
I was thinking about what would you do when other people had hurt you, not inviting you to the cinema or something like that. But what about when we make a mistake? What about when we hurt some other people? Well, then sometimes the right things to say sorry. The band's going to come forward now. We're going to sing our next song for this morning. It's just a little song which is ideal for our children, but it's really for all of us. Sometimes I'm naughty, I know I've been bad, and we say sorry when it's true. Let's stand together and we'll sing. Well, we have a crash, as always, for the very youngest, and our Sunday club program for preschool, primary school children, and then our Bible class for our early teenagers. All these groups and activities now through in the halls. So, for crash and Sunday club, through now to the halls. So let us continue reflecting on this theme of forgiveness. We sing together now. Forgive our sins as we forgive. You taught us, Lord, to pray. Again, shall we stand as we continue in worship?
this whole question of forgiveness and saying sorry. Of course, uh, within the Roman Catholic tradition, uh, there is uh, the whole question of confession, and whereby one of us, whoever it was, would, would go to the priest and we would make our confession and we would be absolved uh, in the name of Christ. Maybe there would be some penance to be done and, and so on. That's how things work. Within our own tradition, uh, we, we do not see the need for us to come personally to a priest or another on our behalf. We believe that we can be on our knees directly, directly before God, that we can confess directly to God without the need for, as it were, someone in between, which is fine. But I wonder if the result of that, one of the results of that is sometimes actually we don't do much confessing at all. I'm not saying we should adopt the, the Roman Catholic practice, but I am saying that maybe as individual Christians, we need to be much more alive to the need that is within all of us to confess and to be doing that on a regular basis, just as our Catholic brothers and sisters do. So as we bow our heads now, and as we pray and make time to be before God, I'm going to leave a time of silence, and it will be very specifically that each one of us might do some of that confessing. And if you're going to tell me that, well, I can't think of anything that I've done wrong ever or that I need to confess, then wake up, call. I'm sure that won't be a problem for you. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Almighty, loving, merciful, gracious God. We are here this morning in your house because you have invited us to come. And by the blood of your Son, Jesus, you have opened the way, opened the door that we might step into your presence. And now we are here standing in the gates of your sanctuary. Loving Lord, we are painfully aware that we fall short of what you call us to, that our living of the Christian life is not all that you intended for us. And so now, with our heads bowed, we would confess to you the ways in which we have fallen short, sinned against you and our brothers and sisters. Hear us as we pray. Heavenly Father, you assure us of pardon and forgiveness. Help us to live then in the light and to live life to the full as you make it possible for us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
The reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke and chapter 23. What we are going to do in the coming weeks is really look back, really reflect at greater depth about all that happened in those hours of Easter. So we begin today with chapter 23 and from verse 26. Listen that we might hear together the word of the Lord. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way from the country, and put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including the women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Amen. And may God bless to us this reading of his word. So before we reflect more fully on the passage, shall we sing together meekness and majesty. This wonderful reminder in song of the divinity and the humanity of Jesus that all was brought together in these hours on the cross, meekness and majesty. Dwells in humanity, kneels in humility. 
It is reported that Elvis Presley turned to his partner at the time and following a very broken and restless night in which sleep was denied him, said to her, I'm going to go through to the bathroom to read. And these now are the reported last words of Elvis. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre was with his partner, the woman he loved, and she reports that the very final thing that he said was this, I love you very much. Now then there was Nostradamus, who of course was well known for predicting and prophesying what was going to happen. He said, tomorrow at sunrise I shall no longer be here. And he got that one right. He wasn't. These were his last words. It's reported that Marie Antoinette, being led to the gallows, trod on the foot of her executioner and said, let me try this. Pardonnez-moi, monsieur. I might have thought of something else to say to the man who was about to bring the guillotine down on my neck. But these are reportedly the last words of Marie Antoinette. And if you look up a dictionary or go on Google, you can have lots of fun by reading famous last words well, there were never more important or meaningful last words than those spoken by Jesus himself. And they are all recorded for us in the Gospels. Seven sayings, seven last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. Some 300 years ago, a little more than that, there was a devastating earthquake which took place in Peru. At that time, there was a Jesuit monk, a Jesuit monk, Alonso Bedoya. And following that earthquake, as a way of trying to bring some kind of Christian devotion to it, this Jesuit monk wrote a service for Good Friday. And the Good Friday service comprised a reflection on all seven of the last sayings of Jesus from the cross. Now, one way or another, that service became popular and took hold widely, not just across Latin America, but in time across the whole of the Christian world. And the service is still widely offered in Roman Catholic settings, even today on Good Friday. Well, now and for these coming seven weeks, we're going to reflect on each of the seven sayings in turn. And as we do so, let us pray that God would speak to us through these sayings, that He would speak to us about His own nature and about the life that He calls us to. The first of the sayings, therefore, is the one that we have reflected on this morning. The first of the seven sayings, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Of course, Jesus said these words, having been crucified. I guess we know only something of the horror of what it means to say that. Physically, what it would be 
to be nailed hand and foot to a rough wooden cross. And that, on top of everything else that he had been through, in the midst of his agony, both physical and emotional, and in the deepest part of his soul, hanging there, he cried out, Father, forgive them. I think the first and perhaps biggest question that we have to consider in relation to this, the first of these seven sayings is this one. Who are them? Father, forgive them. Who are them? Let me offer you various possibilities. Perhaps, first of all, Jesus was asking forgiveness for the two criminals who had been crucified, one on his left and one on the right. I know that Luke reports to us that in the end, one of them seemed to repent of his ways, but up until then, and certainly the other of the criminals did nothing but hurl abuse at Jesus. Maybe Jesus was calling to his father, and, and he had in mind these two men, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. Who is the them? Maybe it was the two criminals. Or was it perchance the Roman soldiers who had scourged Jesus? Which is to say that they had whipped him, but the whips that they had used were made up with little pieces of bone and stone, such that as the whipping was taking place, his flesh was literally being torn. We cannot even begin to imagine the, the physical agony. These same men, these Roman soldiers, had mocked him by putting on him a robe and a crown of thorns. They had insulted him, and ultimately, yes, they were the ones who had nailed his hands and feet to the cross. Some might say they were only doing what they had been trained to do, only doing what they were ordered on that day to do. Even so, was it for them, was it for these Roman soldiers who were at the foot of the cross that Jesus called out, Father, forgive them? Was it them? Or was it the Jewish leaders, the Jewish leaders who had almost from the beginning of Jesus' ministry plotted and planned against him? wanting nothing other in the end than that he be done away with. It was them that conspired. It was them that dragged Jesus to Pilate and with any number of false accusations and witnesses brought about a guilty verdict upon him. Was it for them that Jesus cried out, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they are doing. Certainly, as we go on in the Bible into the book of Acts, there is a sense of them not knowing what they are doing, what they were doing. Here's what Luke, who wrote Acts, has to say. Now, fellow Israelites, he's, he's preaching to them on the day of Pentecost. He says, I know you acted in ignorance as if to maybe back up what Jesus said on the cross. Forgive them, Father, they don't know what they are doing. They do not get it that I am the one sent by you as Messiah. A little later, and also in the book of Acts, the people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, did not know who he was. 
Maybe, therefore, that prayer on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know what, not what they do, was for the Roman, the, the Jewish authorities. There's three possibilities. The two criminals, the Roman soldiers, and the Jewish authorities. Who did Jesus have in mind when he called out, Father, forgive them? Her? Or is that a step too far? Because here's a woman who stamped her toddler daughter to death. Surely it's inconceivable that he might have been referring to such as her. On the 24th of March, just three weeks ago, after one of the longest trials that anyone can remember, Radovan Karavich was convicted eventually of acts of genocide and has been sentenced to 40 years of imprisonment. A monster of a man who personally was responsible for the brutal murder of many thousands of Bosnian Muslims. A monster, a modern day monster of a man. Surely it couldn't be that Jesus' prayer, Father, forgive them. Surely his prayer wasn't meant to extend to include such as him. Let me step aside for one very brief moment. Right now in our world, it is very, very easy to point the finger at atrocities, terrorist atrocities being carried out in the name of Islam. But before Christians are too quick to claim the moral high ground, let us remember that it was Muslims who were the victims of such as he. Christian Serbia against Muslim Bosnia. But maybe you're going to say this. In his trial and throughout all of it, there has been not a shred of evidence of repentance. At no point has he given any indication at all that he is sorry or that he regrets what he did. Neither for that matter did the Roman soldiers who were gathered at the foot of the cross, the ones who had nailed Jesus to the cross, there's no evidence, apart possibly in one man, that these soldiers repented or were sorry. There's no evidence that the Jewish leaders who conspired against Jesus, no evidence that they repented or were sorry. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Remember earlier when the children were still in, I was asking you, would you forgive someone who, who didn't invite you to the cinema as part of a group or broke something of yours? In those little discussions, was there any point at which it was mentioned in your group well, I would forgive them if they said sorry. 
Was there any discussion of repentance being required first? Was there? Any question of that at all? Friends, as I read the gospel, I cannot find it in Jesus that he said, and certainly not as he hung on the cross, Father, forgive them if they say sorry first. Think of the story of the prodigal son as a wonderful example of this love, this extravagant an outrageous love and forgiveness. Did the father, upon seeing his son coming back over the horizon, did he go out to meet him and say, sure, you can come back into the family home if, first of all, you get down on your knees and say you are sorry for what you did. It's not there in our Bibles. Neither is there any evidence of Gordon Wilson saying of those IRA terrorists, I will forgive them if they come before me and if they say sorry for what they have done. No. He said, I'll forgive them. There was no criteria attached to it, no prerequisites put on it. I want to say today that if we are in the business of demanding sorry as a prerequisite for forgiving, then it is not the Spirit of Christ that is alive in us. And that, friends, is tough. That is the radical nature of the gospel. The radical nature of the gospel. That forgiveness comes at a cost. And that forgiveness does not demand, first of all, a sorry. That is tough, but that is the Spirit of Christ as we see it at Calvary and as He spoke it from the cross. So who was them? Father, forgive them. Back to this question, who are them? Could it be you? Could it be me? Us? As Jesus hung there, nails driven through his hands and feet, and as he cried out from the depths of his being, Father, forgive them, was the them possibly us? Was Jesus in that moment asking God to forgive us? Our sins, our hardness of heart, our lack of faith and lack of obedience? I wonder if it was for us. Behold a man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was 
was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I hope his prayer for forgiveness was for the criminals. I hope his prayer of forgiveness was for those Roman soldiers and for those Jewish leaders. And I want to believe in a God whose radical forgiveness somehow can even include a mother who tramples her own daughter. But I think what I want to say today most of all is that I hope, I hope, I pray that his prayer for forgiveness would include such as me and such as you. What we do know for sure is that we are called to live by the Spirit of Jesus. To do as He did and to live His way, which is a different way. The Stoic philosopher, the Roman, I think he summed it up rather brilliantly. You cannot live that way. In other words, lacking forgiveness, you know better. You have to live as someone within whom the Spirit of God dwells. And even from those early days, there have been those who have lived that way. Most famously, perhaps, recorded for us in the book of Acts, Stephen, one of the early disciples. And we find as he is stoned to death by the same authorities who had executed his Lord, we find the same words on his lips, Father, forgive them. You see, the followers of Jesus are called to live as Jesus lived. And when they do, what an impact it makes. There are many who believe that Saul, who became Paul, as he stood there and witnessed the stoning of Stephen, and Stephen's call for forgiveness, his prayer to his Lord, that Saul's heart was touched that day, and that was the beginning of his conversion and turnaround to becoming a follower of Christ himself. What an impact it makes when Christian people forgive. What an impact it made when Gordon Wilson offered forgiveness to the callous and cold-hearted murderers of his daughter. I read an account written of that time, the Troubles, by a journalist who reported on the whole of that period in history. Here's what he said, interviewing Gordon Wilson was the nearest I've ever been to being in the presence of a saint. What was it that was saintly about him? It was his the spirit of forgiveness, the Christ-like spirit of forgiveness. What an impact it made. And I think that in time to come, when the history of Norlin Island is written up, I know that the time from Inniskillen to the time to the, of the peace agreement being signed was a decade. But do not tell me that the witness of Gordon Wilson and others like him did not play its part. The renowned William Barclay says this, Christian forgiveness is an amazing thing. There's nothing so lovely and nothing so rare. Why rare? 
why we do you consider it to be a rare thing? Shouldn't it be a commonplace thing for Christians to forgive? After all, it's what we are all called to here in the writing of Paul. We should live forgiving one another just as we are forgiven. Why rare? Friends, as Christ called out for us, Father, forgive them. Let it be so that we would be people who would exercise that same radical forgiveness in our lives. Therefore, my final question is this. Where do you need to start? Where do you need to start living out that radical forgiveness? This, friends, is the first of the seven words from the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Amen. And may God bless to us the reading and the preaching of His Word. Friends, as we move in now to that part of our worship when we give our offerings, I'm going to invite Chris to come forward and Gabby, Chris's girlfriend Gabby. Gabby is going to sing for us this morning. Not really that. Actually, let me rephrase that. She's not going to sing for us. She's going to offer her song as part of our worship. The song is called, At the Foot of the Cross. At the Foot of the Cross. And therefore, is so apt for what we are about today. So let us give our offerings. But as we do so, let us reflect on all that we have meditated on this morning and on these words, At the Foot of the Cross.
So we stand at the foot of the cross as those first ones, and we claim the forgiveness that Christ cried out for to His Father. The little that we now lay here on the table by way of an offering is a simple response. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Our final prayers before our closing praise for the morning. Perhaps you, you noticed in this morning's news uh, an earthquake has struck Ecuador. This comes in the week where two such quakes have struck Japan. And for those of us who live in a sort of just such an ordinary country, it seems at times, we can scarcely imagine natural disasters of this kind. And yet, all around our world today, there are those caught up. People even now trapped under buildings. People even now knowing their loved ones are trapped or killed. So let us call now on behalf of those who are so affected. Shall we bow our heads and shall we pray? Lord, we begin this morning by praying for those who find it so difficult to forgive. Those who hear that Jesus did and that Stephen did and that Gordon Wilson did but can't imagine doing it themselves. Lord, for them we pray, knowing that it is not an easy thing, but that only by your Spirit can it be so. We pray then for those who struggle to forgive. We pray for them a touch of your Spirit. Lord, we pray too for those who have been forgiven but cannot accept. Those who say, no, I can't forgive you. Someone has come to them and said, sorry, they, they refuse the hand. And we pray, Lord, for those who have wronged others and have not even realized it. Father, they know not what they have done. For forgiveness, we pray. For Northern Ireland, we pray. Though the shooting and the bombing has more or less stopped, still the divisions in that community run deep. There is no future without forgiveness. We pray, Lord, for Northern Ireland and all its people. And now, Lord, for Japan, and for Ecuador, we pray for those, two, for those two countries, Lord, on either sides of the globe, far from us, and yet we know of the devastation, and so we pray for the rescuers, for the emergency services, for the authorities as they seek to respond, and for those who are trapped for those who have been bereaved, for those who have been injured. Lord, hear our prayers. This morning we ask them, in Jesus' name, amen. So friends, we come to the, the closing act of praise this morning in our worship. Come and see, come and see. Come and see the King of love. Just as many, while he was on earth, came to see who this Jesus was, so we are invited even now to come into his presence, bow at his feet, 
and to adore Him and to offer Him our love. Let's stand together. Come and see. Father, as you have forgiven us, send us out as forgiving people. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all, resting upon us and remaining with us now and forevermore.
As you will see uh, prepared here at the front of the church are the elements of communion. If you would like to stay to share in the bread and wine, you're invited to move from wherever in the church to the front and middle section, the front and middle part of the church where we will share together in communion. In those few moments while that is happening, uh, please with home group leaders uh, such as are here today, come and meet me for a moment just down in this corner. Thank you very much.
friends we were speaking this morning about forgiveness and confession and so on. Well, I have to admit that I was coming down here this morning thinking, okay, we'll get through the service by about quarter past 12. I'll go through the niceties of saying hello to one or two, and then I'll get right back up the road, and I'll only have missed about 25 minutes of Rangers Celtic, which is, of course, a fairly important semi-final of the Scottish Cup. Completely forgotten that it was communion, and when I came in and saw things ready, so I confess that I was thinking about the football more so. It, confession is good for the soul. There you have, I have done it. But joking apart, joking apart, do you know I think today of all days, given our theme that we have shared this morning about the forgiveness that was called out for from the cross, I think of today of any days, it is good that we're going to gather at the table for bread and wine. So shall we stand and prepare our hearts by singing together, put peace into each other's hands. Put peace into each other's hands. Look one another warmly in the eye. Shall we now share together then in the peace of Christ? Peace be with you all. Peace be with you. of Paul recorded for us concerning the Lord's Supper. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took a piece of bread, gave thanks to God, broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way after the supper he took the cup and said, this cup is God's new covenant sealed with my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in memory of me. This means that every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he shall come again. Let us pray. Lord, we lift up our hearts to give you thanks and praise 
It is our right to do so, our responsibility to do so, our joy to do so, to worship you, to gather together with all your faithful people from all times and from every place, and with them to declare, holy, holy, holy Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Most of all, we praise and thank you, Lord, that you gave us your Son into the world to live and to die. Yes, to hang on that cross and to cry out for us on that cross. We thank you for him. Pray now that he would be with us as we share together bread and wine. May your Spirit descend on these elements that they would become for us truly a sharing in Christ. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, we pray. Amen. So it was on that night in which he was betrayed, the night before he hung on the cross. He took bread, gave thanks for it, broke it and said, this is my body for you, broken for you. Do so remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup, said, this is the new covenant. My blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink from it then, all of you. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us now your peace. And now all of you, taste and see that the Lord is good. Perhaps we can respond in the terms of the song that we sang, that we could each cradle our hands to receive the bread. And then when all have been served, we would share together the body of Christ was broken for all of us. The body of Christ now for you.
take and eat then, for the body of Christ was broken for you. And in the same manner, receive now the blood of Christ which was poured out for you. Drink then, all of you. Let us pray. Lord, we sing of amazing grace. We speak of your amazing grace. And even now, we have experienced your amazing grace. The promise of forgiveness, the invitation to wholeness and life in all its fullness. Let us go from here as Easter people, forgiven people, risen people, to live for you and for your glory, now and forevermore. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. Thank you.